Hello everyone and welcome. We're going to get started. Good evening. My name is Diana Bannon and I am the chairperson for the East Long Meadow Youth Safety Committee and I'm also a school counselor here at Birchin Park Middle School. And on behalf of our committee, we'd like to thank you all for joining us here this evening, especially for taking time out of, time out of your busy schedules to come and get informed, to get educated on the dangers and health risks of vaping. Our goal for the evening is for you to be able to leave here feeling like you have a better understanding of what is vaping, what is juuling, what does it look like, and what are the health risks, as well as how do we talk to our children about vaping and hopefully prevention. Our purpose this evening was to be able to raise awareness and to be able to educate parents, students, staff on the dangers of vaping. As a school district, we don't consider ourselves experts on this topic, and we have gone through different types of training so that we can educate ourselves on something that's becoming and is known now as the new look of nicotine addiction. So a lot of this is new to us as well, and this is just the start or the beginning, I should say, first steps that we are taking as a school district um, to be able to raise awareness and educate ourselves as well as parents and students. So we have a really informative evening for you today, and I just wanted to go over a little bit of what the agenda would look like. So we have an agenda on our screen here, and we're going to start with a video from YouTube that's actually called Jewelers Against Jewel, and it's a youth perspective from young teenagers who have experimented with vaping and have become addicted to it and what it's like for them and now thinking back on it they are sharing their experiences of what they wish they had known before and what they wish they could have done differently um, after our video we have a you know wonderful presenter that we're very lucky to have here this evening um, her name is sarah moriarty and she is the program director of the hamden county tobacco free community partnership I actually went to one of her trainings about a month ago in West Springfield and thought she did an amazing job and the Youth Safety Committee discussed it and decided that we would really like to be able to invite Sarah here to East Long Meadow to be able to do that same presentation. So we're very honored to have her here this evening and very grateful that she gave up her time to be able to do this um, and help educate our community as well. After the presentation, we're going to have some time to be able to ask Sarah questions regarding the presentation. Um, a lot of the things that she's going to be talking to you about are really the basics to make sure that everyone is aware of what is vaping, what is juuling, what are the differences, what do they look like, um, as well as the health risks, and of course, how do you talk to your children about it. So our goal is for you not only to leave here with a better understanding, but also to be able to feel like you have some tools to talk to your children and hopefully encourage prevention of vaping. We also have a panel of speakers that are going to be able to um, focus on their roles here in the school district. So we have a panel of school administrators, our superintendent, our athletic director, assistant principal, health teacher, and our resource officer um, who will be able to answer some of your questions as well as share a little bit about their perspective and what they're seeing in dealing with vaping in schools. Um, after the panel of speakers, we'll give you guys an opportunity to again ask questions that you might have that have not maybe been answered. Um, and one of the things that we normally do when we have events like this is we have something that's called a ask it basket. And some of you who've been to our events in the past are familiar with it. Um, there will be a basket passed around with pens and little index cards. And if there are questions that you have that might have not been answered, um, please write your question down in the index card, place it in the ask it basket, and continue to pass it. And you can put your name or email address and phone number just in case we don't get to your question and answer it. We can then get back to you at a later time. Um, and just some housekeeping things, if you are a student at the middle school or the high school, we hope that you have signed in so that you can receive community service hours. 
and also so that you can receive homework pass if you're at Birchland. Um, at the end of the event, we do have um, some evaluation forms that we'd love for you to fill out. Um, and we also have a parent survey. So a little bit about the Youth Safety Committee. We meet regularly every month and we, you know, our members consist of our superintendent, um, East Long Meadow Police Department, school nurses, school um, leader, health teachers, um, school counselors, and what's been really beneficial to us is that we collaborate with the Springfield Department of Health and Human Services. And that department um, also has a parent survey that really allows us to be able to collect data. And the more data that we have, the more that we can offer programs like this and the more statistics that we can give you on East Long Meadow and what's actually happening here in our town. Um, so I'm hoping that before you leave, you'll take a few minutes to just fill out the evaluation to let us know what you thought of the event. Hopefully that you're leaving here with some new tools and that you have a better understanding, but we, we want your honest feedback of what we could have done differently or better um, and other things that you might be interested in hearing more about. So other events that we can plan in the future. Only takes a few minutes and we would really appreciate it. And then last but not least, um, we do have a, a raffle. So we do have four um, pretty good prizes, I would think, some gift certificates. Um, but you do have to be here and present in order to win them. So we do want you to stay till the end. Um, so without further ado, we are gonna get started with a very short video on um, Jewelers Against Jewel. in class. I think that kids leaving school desperately needing pods happens a lot and it shouldn't happen but kids are very addicted to these e-cigarettes and 
need this stuff to be satisfied. People will go during class, people will go to the bathroom, people will go between classes, people will go in the car while they're driving home, Any, pretty much any moment where they can be um, away from the, the eyes of parents, they'll just be drooling and, and like all day. Certain people will go through a full pod a day, which is like about the same nicotine content as a pack of cigarettes. Hi, my name is Margarita and I'm 14 years old and I use the Juul. Sometimes during class, like I'll leave, like if I get really stressed, like it's kind of like my go-to, like I kind of need it. It's just a part of my life now that like, I know it's bad, but I can't stop. I'm Sylvia and I'm 14 and I've been using a jewel for nine months. When I'm doing my homework every night, I'll be writing and then all of a sudden I'll want a jewel rip and I'll have my pencil in my right hand and my jewel in my left. Some of my friends have tried using cigarettes and it's because they have been jeweling because they're so used to jeweling that they just think it's okay to use cigarettes. If you banned um, most of the flavors, like fruit flavors or just like food flavors, I think that not as many kids would try it because it's not as like appealing. If there were no flavors, kids would not be as attracted to these jewels. Banning e-liquids would, would force a lot of kids to make the right choice. I, I for sure think that. So we wanted to start off with that video um, just to kind of give you a little bit of an idea of a youth's perspective on how quickly they can become addicted to it and um, if they knew the dangers beforehand, they might think twice about be starting to vape, um, as well as how it's marketed and how um, we're going to talk a little bit more about that, but just the flavors, the coloring, um, very much marketed to adolescents. So with that, um, I would like to introduce to all of you Sarah Moriarty. Sarah, welcome. Hi everybody, welcome. Thanks for coming out tonight. That's a really, um, a really powerful video and I typically will, I've been showing that video at the end of my presentation and um, watching it before my presentation I think is is really powerful. I'll talk about a lot of the things that come up in that video and touch on a lot of the different um, topics that are brought to light in that video, but um, as a parent of an 11 year old, that video moves me a little bit and I'm sure all of you sitting here with youth beside you that must move you as well, and it, it's almost a little bit hard to watch to see those young faces kind of in that state of addiction and, you know, obviously targeted by the tobacco industry and so kind of in that 
addiction phase. So we'll discuss it a little bit more as we go on. I, um, as has already been mentioned a few times, so I'm not gonna, I'm gonna breeze through some of this because some of the information we're gonna go over is basic and I know we hear a lot about um, vaping in the news every day, so I don't wanna bore you with things that I think you probably already know. I wanna get to some of the things that I think are important to you and that you really wanna need to know. Um, so again, I work for the Hamden County Tobacco-Free Community Partnership. I work out of the Gindara Center. There are eight other community partnerships across the state. We're funded through the Department of Public Health, and we all do similar work in different areas across the state. Um, we work to educate. We work on outreach interventions. We work on local policy throughout different areas across the state. I cover all of Hamden County, so I work on policy and education and outreach all across Hamden County. This graph gives a picture of what the local use of e-cigarettes compared to the adult use of e-cigarettes is in Hamden County. So the black graph shows um, the adult use of e-cigarettes in 2018. The yellow graph illustrates, I'm sorry, I can't see anything on this computer. The yellow one um, is the Massachusetts high school use that's 20%, and then the Hamden County High School use was 20%. So we're in line with the Massachusetts state kind of levels for e-cigarette use for youth, but you can see a real disproportion with the adult use and the youth use. So clearly, youth are using these products at a much higher rate than adults. This graph illustrates um, the different types of products that are being used across the state. So here we're talking about e-cigarettes. E-cigarettes are represented here in the red. And these other illustrations talk about any tobacco products and then cigarettes. So cigarettes are not really being used anymore. In Massachusetts, we've done a really good job at taxing tobacco products. We've done a really good job at getting the word out that um, cigarettes are, are gross, we're not letting people smoke in public places as much anymore, so we've gotten the message out that smoking is no good, right? So people aren't doing that as much. Kids are growing up in environments where there's not, they're not exposed to smoking as much. So we've gotten that message out. But what we haven't done is gotten the message out that all of these new and emerging products, they're out there, they're cheap, they're accessible, they're marketed to kids, they're in fruity flavors, they're in bright packages. In convenience stores, they're kind of placed at eye level for the youth. And what's happened now is that youth are using these products at a higher rate, and they're using them more than cigarettes. So youth are used, in 2017, 41% of mass high school youth had ever used and tried e-cigarettes. High school youth current use of e-cigarettes was higher than the use of any other tobacco products combined. So all other, all other tobacco products combined, they're using e-cigarettes more than all of that together. So nicotine. Nicotine is what's found in an e-cigarette. Nicotine is the addictive property that's found in a traditional combustible cigarette. So vaping devices and e-cigarettes contain the nicotine. The nicotine is what's addictive. It's what's causing the, the issues. We can't be sure what else is in these products or how much nicotine they contain. One of the major popular products on the market right now for e-cigarettes is the Juul. In the Juul, and they talked about it in the video that you just saw, they have these little pods, and I don't have one to show you, but the Juul pods are about this big, teeny tiny. In that little jewel pod, that contains your nicotine. In that one little jewel pod, there's enough nicotine in that that equals the equivalent of an entire pack of traditional cigarettes. So a youth who's using a, a jewel pod is going through what would be the equivalent of an entire pack of cigarettes. So you have a youth who's never smoked, never used any kind of tobacco products, is now essentially, if they're going through a pot a day, going through an entire pack of cigarettes worth of nicotine. So that's a huge issue. And not to mention the other chemicals and all the other junk that also goes along with the e-cigarette. 
So what does nicotine do? For a long time, um, all of the research that we have, all of the science that we have has been on traditional cigarettes. So you're talking about the science has been on tobacco and nicotine together. So one of the issues with these cigarettes and why the market was able to come out and say, well, they're safe and you can't tell us different is because the science hasn't been able to catch up yet, right? Because all the science we have is on traditional cigarettes. So now the science is having to catch up and do all this research on nicotine alone as a standalone product. So it's getting caught up. We're finding out what's in these products, but it's just not fast enough. So now what we do know, we can say a few things about nicotine as a standalone. So nicotine, we know it damages the developing adolescent brain. It can prime the adolescent brain for addiction to other substances later in life. Youth who use e-cigarettes are more likely to become traditional cigarette smokers. People who start smoking or using tobacco products in adolescence smoke more and have a harder time quitting than people who start as adults. One of the other things that's really important to mention, and um, they talked about it a little bit in the video, is that because the adolescent brain is still developing, it's still not primed, it's not at the same um, level as an adult brain is. Youth who start using tobacco products and who introduce tobacco into their system at a younger age, they set themselves up to be more susceptible to addictions to other substances also. So the earlier you start using nicotine or tobacco products, the more likely you might become addicted to other substances down the road. So you're really setting yourself up to um, the potential to be addicted to other substances, which is really dangerous. That, and we'll talk about it a little bit later, um, is the whole idea behind the T21 movement and the state of Massachusetts moved the legal purchasing age to 21 as of January 1st. But that really was the idea behind that, was to try to delay the age of initiating tobacco into a youth's system as long as you can. So the idea was where um, a 16-year-old might be around an 18-year-old and have access to tobacco, it's less likely that a 16-year-old would be around a 21-year-old, um, making it less likely that they would get their hands on tobacco products. So the longer you can wait to start introducing nicotine to a youth, the less likely they are to become susceptible to other addictions later in life. So it's really important. Um, one of the things that they talked about in the video was the different ways that the tobacco industry will go out of their way to um, target youth. And this is what the tobacco industry has had to do to Keep, effectively keep themselves in business because like I said we've done a really good job at getting the word out that smoking is gross and a lot of kids would never even think about touching a cigarette because they haven't grown up around it no one in their home smokes you don't go places nobody smokes when I grew up everywhere you went you smoked you smoked in restaurants you smoked you know everyone around me smoked parents smoked in cars it was the norm. Now kids grow up and no one, uh, it's just a social, there's a stigma associated with it. It's a whole different world. So we've done a really good job of getting that message out. So the tobacco industry is essentially losing its customers. So what they've done to kind of supplement that and to try and re-engage a whole new generation of smokers is that they've gone and tried to figure out a way to re-engage a whole new generation. But to do that, they know that they've had to engage a younger, a younger market. And to do that, they've had to attract kids because nobody likes the taste of tobacco. So the way that they've done that is to make their products sweet, cheap, and easy to get. Um, we see that with the e-cigarettes and the fruity flavors, the juice pods, the candy flavors, cotton candy, chocolate, mint, whatever that might be. Um, this graph kind of illustrates the amount of dollars spent on e-cigarette advertising um, in comparison to uh, the youth use. So you can see the more money that they spend on advertising, the amount of youth use rises. So it just goes to show how much money the tobacco industry has and kind of what that plays into. 
again, this is something we always talk about. We always talk about the sweet, cheap, and easy to get, and those are the three kind of key things that the tobacco industry is always looking to kind of keep things in the hands of their, um, their consumer. If they keep it sweet, they keep it cheap, and they keep it easy to get, they know that they're gonna be able to entice the youth. The e-liquids, this is something that we might see change, and we're gonna talk about a little bit about the FDA and how they're trying to crack down on some of this, and that will hopefully effectively keep some of these products out of the hands of the youth and keep them less attracted um, to these products, but so far that hasn't 100% happened yet, but hopefully in the future that will happen. But sweet has been the main factor, which is keeping the youth attracted to these products. They make them in flavors like chocolate, cotton candy, fruit punch, mango. Obviously, a youth isn't gonna walk into a store and say, a guy really would like a uh, tobacco flavored e-juice. You know, they, they don't like the flavor. Um, what the tobacco industry does to make them more appealing is obviously put them in bright packages, make them candy flavored, and the youth are obviously drawn to that. The flavors also help to make them seem like a harmless product. Sweet flavors, do they appeal to the adults? One of the things I always say is that I don't know of many men, many 60-year-old men who walk into the convenience store at the end of a hard day and say, man, I really need my cotton candy blunt wrap. You know, it, it just doesn't happen. It's really the youth that these um, companies are trying to appeal to. And this graph kind of illustrates who's using these products and kind of who the, con who the consumer is. And it, it, again, it just illustrates that the youth are the, the primary users of these products. So e-cigarettes, 81.5%, youth ages 12 to 17 who report flavoring as a primary reason for using the tobacco products. And I would assume that these numbers are even higher today than they are um, reported here from just over a year ago. Another point that we always talk about is uh, the cost of these products. I believe that cigarettes are over $10 a pack now. Again, Massachusetts has done a really good job at taxing their products, um, their tobacco products, and making them harder for youth to get their hands on. But a lot of these OTPs, um, other tobacco products, such as blunt wraps, um, those little flavor tobacco products, and especially the e-cigarettes are very affordable for youth, a couple dollars for some, under $10. E-cigarettes now can be bought at corner stores. I don't know if, does East Long Meadow have any vape shops? How many? Three. It's a small town to have three vape shops. That surprises me. Okay. Um, yeah, so there are vape shops now popping up all over. A lot of convenience stores look like little mini vape shops now. They're all kind of turning into shops with their little side counters with their pipes and, you know, whatnot. So these, these products are easily available to youth kind of everywhere you go. Online is a huge issue. You, uh, everybody's 18 online. You have to click a button and you're an adult. A lot of things can be delivered to people's homes and you know things like that. So accessibility is a real issue. So that's something that's always an issue. Easy to get, we talked about this. Vaping products are everywhere, you know. A lot of education has to be done with retailers and making sure that compliance is, um, is enforced and that the boards of health are making sure that shop owners are um, uh, checking for IDs and things like that. So what is vaping? Vaping, the process of vaping is the inhaling and exhaling of the aerosol or the vapor, it's produced by an e-cigarette or a similar battery-powered device um, called e-cigs, vapes, pen, vape pens, e-hookahs, pipes, tanks, mods, vapes. I always tell people 
as soon as you think you know every name for it, um, the youth are going to be calling it something else. Uh, a lot of times, the youth will call them by their brand names, so like Jewel or Blue or Bo or others. There's always a new name. I never know all the names. There's new products that come out every week. Um, the, the, it produces an aerosol. It's not just a harmless water vapor. There's a lot of controversy over it, what comes out of an e-cigarette and that it's harmless and it's just water. It's, it's not. It's an aerosol. There's chemicals that are inside of this aerosol. It's, not, it's certainly not harmless the same way you wouldn't want um, the secondhand smoke from a cigarette being omitted near you. You also shouldn't necessarily want that secondhand aerosol being omitted around you. It can contain um, harmful substance, it has the nicotine, it has ultrafine particles that can be inhaled deep into your lungs. It has diacetol, that's um, a chemical that's linked to serious lung diseases. It has organic compounds, cancer-causing chemicals, nickel, tin, lead, and a bunch of other things that we probably don't even know depending on, depending on how it's marketed. There's no safety regulations so far on how these things are manufactured so really you don't know what you're getting depending on where you're buying these products from so depending on where you're ordering it from if it's coming from who knows where you really don't know what's in the product that you're buying um, the big million dollar question can e-cigarettes be used to vape other substances yes of course Really, whatever can be put into an open system in a vape device. Um, so I've heard stories of youth using the THC oils in a vape system. I've heard of um, youth being able to alter the vape so that no aerosol is omitted. Um, so they can vape and then there's no detection of any kind of vape so that they are putting other substances in there and then you can't smell anything. So really there's, there's a lot of different ways that these devices can be altered. So it, it's dangerous. And then the closed systems would be those pre-filled pods which would be more common with a jewel system or something like that that you would buy. So those can't be altered as much but the more expensive pods or mods that you would buy in a vape shop, those can be altered more, I believe. Are e-cigarettes safe? E-cigarettes are not safe for youth, young adults, pregnant women, adults, or anyone who, um, anyone who does not currently use any tobacco products. E-cigarettes first hit the market and came out um, being toted as a cessation tool. And I think for people who use them properly as a cessation tool, as a step-down method, um, I think that that is one way to use them. But I think what we're dealing with now is an epidemic of, of teens and youth who have never had nicotine in their systems um, and who are now putting double, quadruple, sometimes even more um, amounts of nicotine into their systems. Um, is extremely dangerous. Uh, more research is needed to understand the long-term health effects. Secondhand vape, like I mentioned before, is also not safe for people to be around. There's no safe level of secondhand smoke, so I would also say there's no safe level of secondhand vape, and still more research needs to be done to figure out what's in all of that. So how do you know if your students or our children are vaping. Um, I always tell people if there's any kind of unexplained sweet scent that you don't recognize or you haven't smelled before and you just kind of can't figure out what it is or where it's coming from, I would look into that more. Could be a flavored e-juice for a vaping device. Um, if you notice any unfamiliar products, if you come across unusual pens or things that look like USB drives or any unfamiliar battery or battery charging devices. They could be associated with vaping. They're constantly coming out with new products. So really, I always tell parents to 
just research it. Always be Googling new products and researching and going on YouTube and seeing what's out there and what's new and kind of coming out um, on the market. I think at literally every single week somebody notifies me of a new product, so there's really no way of staying 100% on top of it other than just research. Um, the Massachusetts Smoke-Free Workplace Law just uh, talks about how um, you're able to stay free of smoke in your workplace, and the Education Reform Act ha talks about how you're able to have um, no smoking on school property. These were adjusted in, in January of 2019, well, January 1st, 2019, to all include vaping as well. So that's something that's new. So all of these laws that kept you protected from smoking now also include vaping, and that's something that's new. So you know if you're at a sporting event at your child's school, you're not permitted to smoke, you would also no longer be permitted to vape. Um, the T21 movement, which I had talked about briefly, I talked about kind of the reason behind it and that it was to um, essentially try and keep youth from picking up the habit of smoking and try to delay that initiation of tobacco use as long as you possibly can. And that went into effect in Massachusetts January 1st, 2019. Some cities and towns in Massachusetts were already doing it. I'm not sure if East Long Meadow was one of the ones that was doing it before the deadline, um, but a lot were already doing it. And it, I, I think it's a good rule. Uh, I think it's, it's been effective in cutting down the smoking rates. And I think that it, it, will, it will continue to keep the smoking rates down in Massachusetts. Some updates on the FDA and kind of what its plans are for trying to curb the e-cigarette use in Massachusetts. Um, the FDA decided in November there was all this anticipation of the FDA really getting tough with e-cigarette companies and um, everyone got real excited. We thought that they were really going to get tough and just ban sales and um, just kind of wipe the board of these products. And we all waited and waited and they came down with basically a plan for how they were gonna handle the e-cigarette companies but no real action. So essentially the FDA came down and said that they were going to um, get ready to get tough with e-cigarette companies. So they haven't gotten tough yet, but they're going to, they said. So they are going to make sure that all flavor products for e-cigarettes, so all of the flavor juices and things like that, are going to be sold exclusively in adult-only establishments. So that means you'll have to be 21 to go into an adult-only establishment to purchase those things. So that will curb some of that youth use. That will, that will be helpful. Um, that will be all the e-liquids, all the cartridge systems, um, excluding mint and menthol. That may change because there'll be some menthol stuff, I think, coming down the, the pipe. Um, that's kind of a whole other animal, the menthol, the menthol fight. But for right now, they're going to work on flavor products being sold in adult-only establishments. They're going to heighten their measures for verification of age for online sales. That will help. They're going to work towards eliminating the sales of flavored cigars because um, it's been found that youth use those products more than adults. And then our friends at Juul. Juul kind of owns the market on e-cigarettes. Youth use Juul products more than any other e-cigarette product out there on the market. So right before the FDA came down with their ruling, um, everybody knew the FDA was going to do something. So two days before the FDA came out with their announcement, Juul deleted their social media accounts, and Juul said, we are no longer going to sell any flavor pods. We're done. So Juul kind of said, we've made billions of dollars, but we're the good guys here. We're done. We're not going to sell any flavored products. We care about the youth. We're off Facebook. We're off Instagram and we've made our money and we're bowing out. So 
Juul is no longer selling flavor pods or any kind of flavor products other than their menthol, and um, they are off social media. So hopefully that will help curb some of the youth use since they were the top seller for youth. So we will see what happens with that. Um, the one caveat I will say to that, um, because people always say, oh, isn't that a little too late? Um, they've made their billions of dollars, so I'm sure that they're happy. One of the downfalls we have with all of this is now we have all of these youth who are essentially addicted to nicotine, and we have a real lack of resources to get youth services. Um, I have a friend who has a son who got caught with a jewel a year ago, and she said, okay, cut it out. I don't want to see the jewel again. Kid said, okay. A year later, kid gets caught with the jewel again. And she said, I told you to cut it out a year ago. What's going on? And the son says, I can't stop. So now we have a youth who's been using the e-cigarette for over a year, who is now addicted to the e-cigarette. But now what do we do? Now we have a youth who's addicted. There are very few services for youth for cessation. Um, so this is the other side of this. So I think that that's the conversation that needs to be had. There's very few supports for youth um, for cessation. So it's really easy to say, stop the behavior. But there's this whole other shoe that's going to drop, is that we have youth who need support, um, need cessation services, are legitimately addicted to these products. So we have to remember that. It's very easy for us to say, okay, stop this negative behavior, but we have a real issue of addiction here. And I know that um, in today's world, we have a lot of really scary things going on, and really, we have opioids, we have alcohol, we have a lot of really scary things that our teens face, um, and sometimes vaping or tobacco might seem like the lesser of a lot of evils. Um, but this is also a very scary, real addiction issue that can lead to further addiction. So I, I just hope that parents take this one very seriously and can, you know, there needs to be a community conversation about what supports we set up for our youth around this issue. So that's just something I like to, to kind of have parents think about. Um, it's really easy as parents for us to say, okay, stop, because I said so, but our, our youth are going to need some support around how to stop this, so it's a conversation we need to have. Um, so these are some pictures of some products that have been confiscated at, lo I won't name any local high schools, none from this high school, um, but these are kind of the hot products that are found typically in schools. A lot of jewels, but these are kind of the hot products. So what can we do? The best thing you can do is kind of what you're doing right now is educate yourselves, be aware of what these products look like, what they smell like, um, what the kids are using, understand what language the youth are using for these products. I, um, I always tell this story that we were talking with some youth and we were trying to ask them what they were using and we were asking them if they were vaping and they were like, no, we don't vape. And then we had said, oh, but you jewel, and they were like, yeah, we jewel. We're like, well, that's vaping, but we were using the wrong language. So really making sure that you understand what language your youth are using and you're on the same wavelength as them, because you could be talking about the same thing, but if you're not using the same language they are, you're on a whole different playing field. Um, know the policies and procedures of your schools and the towns that you live in. We talked about the fact that you have three vape shops in town visit them, maybe get to know the owners, what are their policies. Uh, 84 chapters are really good if you're not familiar with them. You can, they have a website and if you have youth groups in your schools that might want to join um, in 84. It's always a good way to have local uh, connection to some t tobacco activities. Talking with your youth, talking with your students as a trusted adult, I, I just tell people 
just to be talking to your youth and having that conversation. Providing them with facts about vaping, uh, about how the e-cigarettes contain nicotine and how it's an ex extremely addictive um, substance. Dispelling some of the myths, letting them know it's not harmless. Um, talking about how many dangerous chemicals there are. Ask them what they see. What are your friends doing? What are they using? What are you seeing in the hallways? Just asking them what's going on. Sometimes it's as simple as that. Um, just talking can protect them, being patient, ready to listen to them, um, knowing that there's no perfect time to have that conversation, just driving in the car, just kind of a casual conversation doesn't have to be some planned out attack. Ask your child what they think, you kind of want it, they're the experts in this, they know what's going on being open and honest. And I always tell people if you're a tobacco user yourself, think about how that's gonna change the dynamic of the conversation. And then I just wanted to list some additional resources. There's a great website, this getoutrage.org website. It has a lot of tools and tips for talking, for parents, for schools, toolkits. It's really great. And then um, our 1-800-QUIT-NOW, it's a resource quit line hotline, but now um, something that's new is that they will talk with anyone ages 12 and over, and it's a cessation quit line, so that's something new. They used to only work with adults, but if you have anyone 12 or over who needs some support around cessation, they're there and free of charge, they'll speak with anyone. So that is all I have for you. Thank you so much, Sarah. So at this time, um, I'm actually going to call our panel of speakers up to join us up here. Um, and Sarah, I'm going to have you join us as well so that we can give the audience an opportunity to be able to ask any questions that they might have. And I believe we have about 15 minutes left so that we can be able to hear from the panel of speakers, ask questions, and you will be getting evaluation forms um, passed out to you, as well as the parent survey, if you don't mind just taking a minute and filling those out before you leave. Um, and then we can get to the raffle at the very end. So um, before we introduce the panel, um, are there any questions so far regarding the presentation? Anything that you're thinking about right now? There was a lot of information that was given to us. We have a question right here. Four is a youth-led movement, but it's run by the state of Mass, by the Department of Public Health, and it's a youth-led movement, but you can join, like a youth group could join for the school, and they do tobacco-related initiatives, but there's funding through the state, so if a youth group in a school wanted to join, but they have a website, the 84.org, so you can check it out. Great, thank you. Any other questions for Sarah regarding the presentation? Anything that you have questions about? Okay, so I'd like to start by just introducing our panel of speakers. Um, first, we have um, our superintendent, Gordon Smith. Um, Birchland Park principal, Timothy Allen. High school athletic director, Kevin McGee. East Long Meadow High School assistant principal, Frank Page. And also assistant principal, East Long Meadow High School, R.J. Merhafka. Did I say that right, R.J.? Close. <laughs> thank you. Ladies. Can you say that again, R.J.? Merhafka. Merhafka. Thank you, R.J. Um, Birchland Park health teacher, Kathy Hood. And our East Long Meadow resource officer, Mike Healy. So I did want to mention, too, that... Um, we were able to bring to you this evening um, some items for you to be able to see, either on your way out or when we're finished. <laughs> um, they're on the table right now with Officer Healy. Um, we'll also maybe put them over here in this area if you want to take a look so that you can actually see what some of these products look like. Um, 
So we're going to get started with, um, I just want each member of the panel to kind of just take a, a brief, quick minute and kind of explain your role and your experience with vaping in the school district. So we're going to start with our superintendent, Gordon Smith. Sure. Thank you. Thank you to all of you for coming out this evening. Um, similar to what you saw in Ms. Moriarty's presentation, we're in a, a developing situation. Last year, prior to the law changing, we changed all our policies that prohibit tobacco, tobacco use on school campuses. Uh, we added nicotine, any product containing nicotine. Um, we're in the process of updating our signs and doing that type of thing. But as we go down the line here and you hear um, different people's roles in the school system, we're trying to figure out what is the best response. As also in the presentation you saw that for the last probably 20 years, 25 years, we've been developing ways to prevent cigarette smoking. And that's worked. It took a long time to work, and now we're back at the beginning stages again with vaping. Um, and so we're looking to inform, educate, and figure out what's the appropriate response when students are vaping on campus, in schools, and how do we partner with not only um, our local police force, but with parents, teachers, and students in making sure we're getting this message out. Thank you, Mr. Smith and Mr. Allen. We unfortunately, um, at the middle school level, are running into issues with this, um, especially in our eighth grade, but um, I don't want to limit it to just eighth grade. So even at middle school level, this is becoming um, an issue, a challenge for us. Um, we are taking it sort of case by case. We're working really closely with our counselors, of course, um, with our nurse. And, you know, when we, when we do, quote unquote, catch a student um, doing this or having this, uh, we, we do go at a case by case basis. Um, but we like to make sure we teach the student that this is not okay, make sure other students realize that this is something we can't do. Um, but most importantly, my assistant principal, uh, Mr. Martin, has developed a series of uh, sort of articles and videos that any student we find having this issue, they do have to watch the videos, read the articles, and do sort of a reflective assignment. So whether we're, no matter what level of discipline it reaches, there's certainly this reflective component that we think is really important, as well as we're getting more people involved. So it's not just sort of like, vaping happened, here's the punishment. It's, it's way more uh, wrap our arms around that student and make sure others realize it was wrong, but also make sure that we're giving a lot of support and a lot of knowledge to hopefully get that student to stop while there's still time. Great. Thank you, Mr. Allen. And Mr. McGee? I'm Kevin McGee. I'm the athletic director at the high school. The State Association for Athletics does have a chemical health policy that I'm going to review with everybody. Uh, I was a phys ed teacher at the high school for 16 years. This is my third year as the athletic director. I coached for many years. The chemical health policy, when I was a coach, um, there were very limited violations of that at East Middle High School. However, because of the introduction of e-cigarettes and vape pens, all across Massachusetts, chemical health violations have skyrocketed for student athletes. Uh, the percentages are way up across Massachusetts. The athletic directors are aware of this. We are meeting about this in April to talk about ways to uh, help out our student athletes. Um, what we do at the high school, we do a registration where all student athletes and parents have to sign off on the MIA chemical health uh, MIA chemical health policy so that they're aware of it. I do review it at preseason meetings. And I also put it on the top 10 list of reminders for student athletes. One of the biggest misconceptions for the student athletes is the they need to be reminded that the MIA policy includes using and also possession. So I'm going to read that chemical health policy from the MIA and then talk about what the consequences are as far as athletics goes. So in Rule 62.1, from the earliest fall practice date to the conclusion of the academic year or final athletic event, whichever is latest, a student shall not, regardless of the quantity, use, consume, possess, buy, sell, or give away any beverage containing alcohol, any tobacco product, including e-cigarettes, vape pens, and all similar devices. It goes on, uh, but that's really the, 
the highlight of Rule 62.1. When there is a violation with a student athlete, the consequence is they have to sit out from 25% of their season. So in a sport like baseball, um, if there's a violation, they would be sitting out for five um, baseball games from the MIA if their schedule had 20 games. Um, and then if there's a second violation in the time um, that they're at the high school, it's 60% where they have to sit out from games. So there is um, a definite consequence, and it's something that we're working on across Massachusetts with other athletic directors. Thank you, Mr. McGee. And Mr. Page. Uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk with Ms. Marhefka, and we're going to talk a little bit about um, what we see here at the high school. Uh, but just to build on what Mr. McGee was just speaking about, I think a big reason why he is seeing such a, uh, we'll say, explosion or rapid rise in um, athletes who are getting caught and uh, in violation of the chemical health code is the demographic of students who are using the the e-cigarettes or the jewels or whatever they might be is much different than the kids who are using the tobacco products. I'm in my eighth year in administration and in the earlier years it was the tail end of where we saw a lot of students using tobacco products and the students who were using tobacco products were a very small pocket of students. Um, you know, there was, there was a handful that, that you might catch uh, in possession or using a cigarette or chewing tobacco and the students that we're, uh, we're catching now and we're, we're seeing utilize these uh, these devices are from all walks of life, and um, and I think that's why we see so many of these um, kids getting caught now because it's, it's become normalized. And uh, the students who used to say, there's no way I'm ever going to smoke a cigarette, there's no way you're ever going to catch me dipping in and utilizing chewing tobacco, are much more sadly comfortable using the, these new devices. They, they don't see the, the harm that they're doing. Mr. Marhefka. And another aspect of this that makes, uh, makes vaping appealing to students across all demographics um, is how easily they can, can conceal what they're doing. Um, you know, when, the, when we were dealing more with the actual cigarettes or, or the chewing tobacco, you had you know, large clouds of smoke, you, know, you had students by themselves, that, you, know, they, um, you, you had different uh, items they had to discard. Now, as you saw on the uh, presentation and afterwards, if you take a look at what we, what we have collected up here, um, most of these devices can actually fit right in the palm of your hand. You, they quickly you know, hold it, go to their mouth. It's all, all any mist is gone within seconds. Um, so that's one of the scariest things where, where most concerning things we're seeing across all demographics that it's easily concealed. You, can't, you can barely smell it. You can barely see anything. Um, and uh, they can, it's more, it's e more easily they can get away with it. So. Thank you. And Ms. Hood? I'm Kathy Hood. I'm the 8th grade health teacher at Birchton Park as well as the 6 to 12 department head for health education. Um, so we deal with the education part. I want to say thank you to all the parents because it is something new. I'm old. I'm on my way out. Vaping, I had to educate myself as well as all of my teachers. And our biggest struggle is, and we do include vape vaping curriculum in grades six through 12. Um, and our biggest challenge is dispelling all of the myths that the tobacco industry has put forth. And our students ate it all up, doesn't smell, you're not gonna smell like a cigarette, your hair's not gonna smell, your clothes aren't gonna smell, your fingers aren't gonna smell, your breath's not gonna smell. It's safer is the biggest. So when I'm teaching my vaping lessons, I've had kids challenge me. Like, no, you don't know what you're talking about. That's not what they said. So for us, it is included in the curriculum. Um, the challenge is dispelling what the tobacco industry has put out for your students. And as Sarah, I think, said, it really is about the tobacco industry doesn't care about our kids. Uh, they only care about making money and because cigarette smoking for all demographics and age groups has decreased, they need to replace them with something else at any cost. And so our biggest challenge for us is always making sure that we are informed about what we are teaching your children. And as more information comes forth about the dangers of vaping, uh, that we stay on top of it so that we can inform the, our students themselves. Thank you, Ms. Hood. One of 
One of the things that Mr. Allen brought to light that I don't know that we necessarily mentioned, um, but I think is really important, is that we tend to talk in kind of about high school age, but my what I'm learning and what you kind of brought up is that primarily the biggest issue right now with this is that it's middle school is where the biggest problem is right now. I know high schoolers are using it at the highest rate, but the where I'm hearing it the most and where I'm getting the most calls from and people, when I go to do presentations at high schools, they're usually telling me I'm too late and that the biggest issue is in the middle school and that 11 and 12 year olds are using this at such a high rate that by the time I get to the high school, it's too late and they're really addicted and they've been using it for a couple of years. So really talking with middle school kids and you might think, oh, no way. I mean, I have an 11 year old and I would be shocked to think that he even knew what some of these products were. But when I go to high schools, they're like, you are too late. I've been using this for years. So really knowing that the middle school age kids know what these products are and are already experimenting with some of this stuff. So being aware that this is not just exclusively um, a high school problem. Thank you, Sarah. And also, um, our resource officer, resource officer um, Officer Healy, if you could just mention a little bit about like your role in schools and your perspective on vaping and what you're seeing. Good evening, everyone. I'm Officer Healy. I've been the school resource officer since the beginning of the school year. Um, just a little bit about myself. I've been a police officer for four and a half years. I graduated from East Middle High School as well. Um, throughout the scope of my, my position as a resource officer, I become aware of the popularity and uh, the normalcy of vaping throughout the uh, public school system. Um, myself, as well as the administration of the school, we've all taken a proactive stance in uh, the education and prevention and the control of vaping on uh, school grounds. Uh, the, the, our, our main goal is uh, referring students for help, for the education and prevention of the vape use. It, our goal is not necessarily to, to get anyone in trouble. It's at this, at this age, our, our minds are able to be molded so greatly that if we can start now in instilling that education and that knowledge of the dangers of vaping, that's when we can move forward in the right direction. I believe our state law has done a great job of advancing and adding that uh, the vape in our school, um, uh, against the policies in our school uh, grounds. Um, and my main goal is just, you know, I see a lot of familiar faces in the audience and it's just maintaining that positive relationship uh, with the students and the staff. Um, and just for the parents, you know, watch for the signs as, as the PowerPoint stated. If there's any questions or any comments or concerns about um, anything regarding vaping, feel free to call me, feel free to email me. I'll always return your call. So that's all I have. Great. Are there any questions from the audience? Yes. I have a question because yes. I heard from my middle schooler that it's been a problem at Birchland, but what I was just wondering what what is happening to these kids that are being caught. Like I know I know you can draw on the but it's you know, based on the the student or the situation, but I mean I I was just wondering like are they getting in trouble so that they're scared to do it? I don't know. You know? They are getting <clears throat> They are getting in trouble. That doesn't necessarily mean they're scared to do it. Um, the, most common, the most common punishment for a first offense is a Saturday school detention. So they have to come back to school on Saturday for four hours. That would be, that would be also when they complete their assignment based around the reflection, the essay, uh, the, essay the videos. So that's probably the most common for the first offense. Um, but again, it's... It's so gray because it doesn't necessarily, it's, it's so much more about what they learn about them than the like fear of our punishment. Because um, these are our, you know, when, we, when this happens, these, these are already students that at age 13, 14 ha are willing to try this in school, you know. So clearly, clearly in that case, a lot of the traditional disciplinary measures don't work. Um, but the good thing is when we, when this does happen, we get to reach out to parents so it can bring to light, you know, the issue if, if it hasn't been brought to light. And it can sort of start the, 
the loop of counselor support, nurse support, extra admin eyes, and hopefully learning to make it all better. Any other questions from students, perhaps? Any student questions? Did I see a hand up in the back? No? Question right here. Any suggestions on the social aspects of if we were to focus on the addiction part, that's almost easier to help the student than the fact that even if they want a person to get off it, what are they going to do in front of their friends? And almost like the whole lifestyle will crumble. That's how you know, the fresh job is the other lives are. It's a great comment question. Um, I do want to just kind of um, add to that a little bit. Um, one of the major focus that we have, especially in middle school, is you know student social emotional health and well being. And we do focus on that a great deal at the middle school. There's a lot of different activities that we do regularly in advisory. Um, and it's to be able to raise awareness to students about having self-reflection and being able to have students who are confident within themselves, who have the coping skills to be able to um, you know, self-regulate, manage their social groups, and be able to have a voice and know with confidence that if students are pressuring them to do things that they don't want to do, to feel that confidence in being able to say, I'm just not interested, don't want to, not right now, my parents would kill me if they ever found out I did it, I don't want to get in trouble. There's a lot of work that we do with supporting students and being able to give them you know, strategies to be able to use, and it does come down to us teaching them coping skills on how to deal with all different kind of aspects or situations that they're going to come across. And vaping is just, you know, a small part of it. It also has to do with just, you know, dealing with anxiety, dealing with their friendship conflicts. Um, and it's something that we, you know, have really shifted our teaching practice in to really focus on the social emotional development of adolescents as well. Um, I don't know if anybody else wants to add any more, but you know, I like that you mentioned that because it does have to, it starts with the foundations of being able to build up students and their confidence, as well as teaching them these coping skills to be able to deal with whatever comes their way. Yes, question, yes. So you do raise a good point that it, um, keeping the doors open hasn't completely uh, eradicated the issue. Um, and it is something that we're very aware of and we, we police or we try to monitor and you know every day. Um, one thing I can say is, is that with having the doors open and, and having the, the opening of the door uh, not in years past, you know, when students would hear the door open, that's the automatic signal that somebody may be coming in. So the fact that we can quietly enter, like the boys' room anyway, you know, um, has helped us, you know, collect a lot more items and address a lot more students and interact with a lot more families. Um, but you're right; there's still a lot more work to do to to make sure that students learn not to do this on their own. That's a big piece of it. To that point, the female bathroom where we have the biggest issues is one where there's not a direct line of sight yeah, um, right. to that area, to the open space. So um, I, I would agree. But we, we do see a cut down in traffic in areas where we can more openly monitor uh, those spaces. 
Thank you for sharing that. And, you know, I think part of what we've been talking about tonight, too, and just starting off this evening is talking about how a lot of this is something that we're trying to get a handle on ourselves. So not only educating, you know, ourselves, going through trainings, trying to educate the community, parents and students, it's also trying to figure out what are best practices and like restorative justice when it comes to, you know, disciplining students and educating them at the same time. So, you know, this is just our, just the beginning of us being able to kind of um, take the initiative and try to be able to come up with strategies in different ways that we are able to support students and educate them and hopefully reach prevention. So are there any other questions? I know that we are kind of running out of time and I, I don't want to keep you guys, but any final thoughts? All right, just to wrap up, um, First and foremost, I really want to thank you know this audience. I want to thank you all for being here tonight and joining us. I want to thank you, you know, to the students that I see in the office. That I mean, in the audience, the parents that have attended, anyone from the community. We really appreciate your support. We hope that you're leaving here feeling like you know a little bit more than you know before you arrived, and that you have a better understanding of what vaping and juuling is, and hopefully that you have a little bit more confidence in some tools of how to talk to your kids about the dangers and harmful risks of vaping, as well as just sharing it amongst, you know, your, as parents, your friends, you know, as students, your social group, and being able to have a voice to speak up and say that this is something that's really dangerous and really harmful and that, you know, we need to get educated and we need to be aware of what those dangers are. Um, I'd also like to thank um, Sarah Moriarty for joining us this evening and volunteering her time to share this very valuable and important information with us along with information of what to look for, what it looks like, how to talk to your kids, what are state regulations. So Sarah, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Um, and I'd also like to thank our panel of speakers. Um, it was, we the Youth Safety Committee really appreciate you being on this panel today and taking time out of your day to be here and be able to give your perspective on what your role is in the school district and how you have already been, ex you know, what your experience has been like with vaping. So thank you to this panel, we really appreciate it. And also thank you to the Youth Safety Committee for all your hard work and the time and effort that you guys put in to be able to plan all these events. Um, so, and LCAT for filming this event, thank you as well. Um, so last but not least, we'd like to do the raffle and hopefully you guys are um, filling out your evaluation forms and the parent survey that we will collect as you exit. Um, and just a reminder that we do have some items here that Officer Healy has um, in front of him and we can put them out over here, maybe even on the piano, um, just to put out on display so that you can really take a closer look at what some of these devices look like. Um, so, Ms. Haskell, if you wouldn't mind coming up and doing the raffle. And Mrs. Lombard, thank you. Okay, great. We're going to have our special guest pick, pick a name, Mrs. Moriarty, if you don't mind. Samantha Carey. Are you still here, Samantha? Yep. Thank you, Samantha, from our PTO. Congratulations. I would just. Okay. Yep. Uh, one of our students, hopefully you're still here. Reese Gway, are you still here? Reese? Come on up, buddy. You just won a gift certificate. Congratulations. Okay. I know this parent very well, so hopefully I'm not going to butcher the name. Demetrius Dimitriglou. Did I say that correctly? Okay, congratulations. Come on up. Last but not least, last but not least, Julie Serafini. Are you still here, Julie? Yes, congratulations.
We wish you all a safe and good evening, and we thank you for your participation tonight, and we hope you all have a great night. Thank you.